Well, let me start by saying, you know, often it, 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 when you've been in academia as long as I have, you run into some exceptional people. And, uh, you know, they're, they're exceptional in a lot of ways. One is their work ethic, the other is their character, their personality, uh, their moral ethic. And, you know, I know, you know, people in my position up here talking, usually engaging a bit on permanent. Let me, let me assure you, I'm not going to talk about uh, Kerry Kearney in our talk today. He, uh, right from the beginning, it was obvious that he was going to be uh, exceptional and, you know, his track record proves that. So what I'd like to do is kind of talk to you about uh, a few of the things. I, I read his, I had his, uh, his Vita, and uh, let me tell you, you, you would get through the Old and New Testament quickly. <laughs> It's, it's pretty substantial. But here, here's uh, just a biography, just to let you know where he is right now. As, as you can see on there, he's a professor, faculty of physical education. He's an adjunct professor in the Department of Oncology and, uh, and Medicine, the University of Alberta. He's a Canada Research Chair, which I think says a lot. I mean, they don't have these out uh, that often, and uh, he's well deserving of it, as you'll see in a minute. He's also director of Behavioral Medicine Lab and Fitness Center. And find, find as a scientific staff member at the Cross Center. Now the Cross Center is like it's like South Hospital or Victoria Hospital. So it's it's not a you know it's not cross disciplinary and that's just the name of the place. Where did he come from? Well, he's a Catholic Central grad from, from uh, London, Ontario. And uh, came to Western, got his university, uh, his honors BA, and as you can see up, up there. And then he did his, uh, finished his MA in 1989. Now, here's an interesting point from my perspective. Often, uh, when Kerry was here, uh, he and I collaborated, and because of his goodwill, I was on four referee publications with him. So I often give him credit for being his, uh, his advisor. I have to go, oh, darn it, I'm not. Uh, his, his advisor was Chella Chella Durai. Uh, some of you may know that name. Now it's Ruben Chella Durai. Uh, Chella was a full professor when Ruben was in high school. And uh, he's still an internationally recognized scholar. So when Kerry left here, he went on to the University of Illinois and worked with another internationally recognized scholar, uh, Dr. Eddie McCulloch, and uh, worked in the area of exercise uh, psychology. What's he done? Well, uh, you know, you can see it here. It took me a while to count them. I actually didn't count them. He, he, you know, he numbered it. In fact, one of the things that surprised me a bit is that, that you know, and I, he has them from the most recent is one all the way down to the least recent. I think he did that because he's trying to hide the home damage. But anyway, he has, uh, as you can see, 263 articles, 23 are currently under review. Now, you know, there's many of you out there probably thinking, God, I'd like to have a year like that. <laughs> Let me tell you, you would not like to have a year like that. I, at least I don't think you would. I wouldn't want a year like that. Uh, you know, one of the, what all, any of us who publish here know, you know, we, we get an article and we go to, like, you know, the, the, the journals that are, have been receptive to, to us in the past and maybe we'll have two a year and, and they continue to be receptive. But can you imagine hitting an editor with uh, 23 articles? I mean, that's a volume and so they would probably tell you to go elsewhere. Well, if you look at some of the places that are elsewhere for Kerry, he's published an extensive uh, variety of journals, research journals. And uh, I quit when I was getting down to the very end of the page. I was looking, I went down to the obviously, try to get the new ones as they came up, and uh, I stopped. And, I, and I'm quite convinced, since I didn't go very far, that this is uh, only a partial listing of the places that he published. Uh, you know, he's, as any scholar typically does at his stage, they do, uh, they do summary material. So he's done a, a book, as you can see, an editor one book in 24 chapters. Uh, what I did also is I counted his, uh, his grants. So the, the one at the top, and you can see here I got tired, these are the ones that he was the, the major collaborator on. So I was putting it in my little calculator at $30 million. Now, Kerry's what, what, 40, you told me to carry my memory for that, 45 years old, been a, you know, he's been in academia for, you can do the math. So that's a pretty impressive record. And of course, we don't all start at millions in the first couple of years. So he has done very, very well. And so I'd like to introduce you, or have uh, you give a warm welcome to our guest speaker, Dr. Terry Kearney. Thank you, Bert. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. 
And thank you, Bert, for that very kind introduction. And to Earl and the rest of the staff that selected me for this very prestigious honor. I don't think there's any greater honor for someone to receive than a distinguished alumni from the university uh, that, that you were trained at. So it's, it's an indication that um, they're very proud of what you've done. And that, that means the world to me, because Western uh, is my home university, and London is my hometown, really. And, uh, uh, this is where it all began, and I have a great debt of gratitude to the University of Western Ontario for uh, the preliminary training that I received here. Uh, given that this is a graduate, uh, uh, graduate education award, I thought I'd start off by telling you a little bit about how I got interested in graduate school here and where I came from before I get to the topic of my talk, uh, physical activity in, in cancer survivors. So the, the person who's responsible for me going to graduate school is actually in this room, and that is Craig Hall. And Craig may or may not remember, uh, back in about 1987, I showed up in his motor control class, and I think back then uh, Craig was chair of the graduate program, and he sat on his desk like he oftentimes does, and says, um, graduate school applications are due in a couple weeks. Uh, if you're at all interested in graduate school, you should apply. Just think of it as another option that you might want to consider. So at that time, I was thinking of going into teacher's college. Craig, Craig gave his little spiel there, and I thought, OK, maybe I'll stick an application into graduate school and see where it goes. So I put my application in. And like most undergraduates who are looking which area they should study, I checked which undergrad course I had the highest grade in. And that was motor control. Actually, it was Craig's area. So I said, oh, try to study in the motor control area. Um, so, I didn't get any help from Craig on that side of things, right Craig? <laughs> Apparently the lab was full at that time, so I didn't quite make the short list of, of motor control. So that's, I think, a good lesson for the graduate students that you persist and continue if you're interested in it. But I had uh, Chella Chella Durai approach me, and I had selected sport management as my second area of interest going into graduate school. And Chella came up to me and said, Kerry, I'd be more than happy to take you on as a master's student. So I was very excited and super keen to start with Chella. Uh, as Bert mentioned, Chella's now at Ohio State University, but he was a great mentor for the, the two years that I did my master's degree here. So I really started in the sport management area, a uh, fair ways away from where I'll be getting here shortly. But partway through that degree, I took a course from Bert Karen in group dynamics in sport. And I don't know if Bert's still teaching that course, but that's when his 1988 book just came out, first edition of that book. And I took the course very on in my master's degree training, and it fascinated me, the whole group dynamics area. And in particular, I got interested in the home advantage. And so for that course, I believe I had to submit a proposal as, as part of the grading and actually propose a study. And I proposed a study on the home advantage to Bert. And, uh, uh, he said, you know what, this is interesting stuff. Why don't you go ahead and do the study? So that's how I got interested in the home advantage and began to shift my interest from sport management to psychology. So at the risk of overwhelming everybody, uh, there is the publication number one. So Bert, Bert mentioned 260 or so. Uh, the nice thing about academe is we all start with no publications. And for me, that was publication number one. September 1990, home advantage. So you all know that the home advantage uh, means that the home teams win more games. There's lots of explanations for why home teams win more games. So it's things like support from the home crowd, uh, travel of the visiting team, lots of what they call learning factors. So that the fact that the fields are all different, like uh, the Green Monster in, in Fenway Park for baseball, right? there's an advantage there. And the other thing that uh, Bert and I kind of came up with was the rules sometimes seem to favor the home team. So in hockey, for example, the home team gets last line change, and that's thought to be an advantage. In baseball, uh, one of the things they, they talk about is batting first versus last, with the idea that uh, the home team gets to bat last, as if it were an advantage, rather than the home team has to bat last. So this is viewed as an advantage in baseball. So I thought, how could we test this? And I came across what I thought was a very interesting natural experimenting, experiment occurring right here in the hometown of London. So these are London data. And that is, uh, I played slow pitch baseball. And if any of you played slow pitch baseball, at least the way it was played back then is, you showed up to the diamond and you played two games. 
And the only difference between the games is one team bats last, and then in the next game, the other team bats last. So you have this beautiful natural experiment where everything else is held constant. Right? There, I can tell you there are no crowds at slow pitch baseball, but if there were, it wouldn't matter anyway because it's the same for both games. Right? And the same with the diamond. The diamond is the same both games. The travel is the same both games, uh, and so on. So we decided, uh, I went through thousands of these games to try and look at whether or not batting first versus last had any implications for winning. Now, we threw out all the double headers that were won by the same team because that means the same team won when they batted first and when they batted last. So there's no advantage if the same team wins both games. So the only thing you can look at is where the double header is split. And if it's split, there's two different ways it could be split, right? You could either have uh, the, the, both teams win when they bat first or both teams win when they bat last. And that would be your indication that there's an advantage. So uh, we went through it doing all the data and here's what we found. Published these findings, Jur Journal of Sport and Exercise Psychology, and you can see out of 1120 double headers uh, where the, uh, the games were split, the visiting teams won both games, so this is the team that batted first, won both games 561 times. The home teams won both games 559 times. Um, so uh, not being a very knowledgeable master's student, we subjected this to statistical analysis. <laughs> and we figured out it's not actually different. That's, that's not an advantage for batting first. So virtually identical. In fact, I still remember Bert, he was shocked when I showed him the data. He says, by chance there has to be some difference. We're down to one double header. So of course we concluded from this that, at least in slow pitch baseball, it doesn't matter whether you bat first or whether you bat last. So we scrutinized the data very hard. We looked at uh, differences between men and women, high ability, low ability, early season, late season. Nothing was different. But after looking at these data and thinking hard about the next study, I thought I need to do a randomized trial of exercise in lymphoma patients on <laughs> chemotherapy. I don't know if they're still teaching this type of programmatic linear thinking uh, as the research program here at Western, but that was uh, my thinking at the time. Of course, uh, you'll notice that this is 2009, so that's 20 years of water under the bridge between uh, 1990 when I first published that and 2009. So what, what transpired over this time? As Bert mentioned, I went to University of Illinois and uh, shifted from the sports psychology that I was interested in with Bert Karen to the health and exercise psychology and focused on adherence, motivation in middle-aged adults. And then when I took my first position at the University of Calgary, uh, after about a year or two there, um, I got interested in the cancer area. I hooked up with a, a colleague named Christine Friedenreich, and we've been researching this area ever since. So for about the last 15 years, we've got interested in exercise in cancer patients and survivors. So you might look at this and say, well, therefore the training at the, from Western is not really instrumental in my development, or it didn't really serve any major purpose. But I think for graduate students, there's a couple key points to take away from your training experience here at Western that will serve you well for your careers. Uh, and the first thing I learned here at Western was a passion for research. And that is absolutely critical. You won't get 260 publications or however many publications you end up with if you don't view research as a labor of love. So it really has to be a passion, and both Chella and Bert really modeled that passion for research for me. In fact, when we got that paper published, of course, it was my uh, very first publication. I was quite excited, and I went to Bert, and Bert had many publications at the time, and he told me he was still thrilled with the publication. Even though he had many different publications up until that time, he was still just as excited, he said, with every publication that he got. So that was the passion that I think is critical. Uh, the second thing I learned here at Western is the research methodology. Conducting rigorous, high-quality research is really what's key to developing a research career. And I learned all about statistics and research methodology when I was here at Western. And that type of training serves you well no matter which area you ultimately end up uh, studying because you're applying good uh, research methodology techniques. And the last point for the graduate students is uh, clearly things can change. You can develop different interests and different passions as you move from Western, whether it's onto a PhD or onto a faculty position. But hopefully with the research skills and the passion you learn here, 
it doesn't matter which area of kinesiology you end up studying, you'll be able to have a productive career. So for me, that's what I remember most about Western. So moving on to my current passion. And as I say, I've been researching this area for the last 15 years. And it's an area that not many people in kinesiology have really been studying, interestingly enough. In the past, we've kind of looked at exercise on the prevention of cancer, but once you were diagnosed with cancer, there was very little research looking at exercise in patients or survivors. So how did I get interested in this particular area? Well, these are the cancer statistics. And uh, you'll see that uh, there's 170,000 Canadians diagnosed with cancer every year. Uh, prostate, lung, breast, colorectal are really the big four. You can see it drops off fairly dramatically after the big four there. These four top cancers make up over 50% of all the cancers diagnosed, and they account for over 50% of all the deaths from cancer. But look at it just from a percentage perspective. Okay? This is your risk of developing cancer in your lifetime. For men, 45%. So 45% of men in Canada will be diagnosed with cancer at some point in your lifetime. For women, slightly lower, but about 40%. So those are huge numbers. So either you're going to be diagnosed with cancer or someone in your immediate family is going to be diagnosed with cancer. Those are what the statistics show. So it affects a very large uh, number of Canadians. The other interesting thing about cancer is each disease is very different. We think of cancer as a singular disease, but it's really a collection of over 200 different types of diseases that have very implications for treatments uh, and outcomes. So there's just a few of the numbers of how this cancer, cancers can influence people. The five-year relative survival across all cancers is about 62%, but it varies dramatically based on all these types of cancer from um, almost complete cures for things like thyroid cancer, testicular cancer, these high ones, uh, down to some of the more difficult cancers like pancreatic, esophageal, and lung cancer. So the prognosis can be very different, the types of treatment can be very different. And the question my research group has looked at <laughs> over the last 15 years is what is the role of exercise in helping patients either cope with treatments, recover from treatments, and potentially even influence the risk of recurrence or the uh, improvements in long-term survival. These high incidence rates, so we got lots of Canadians being diagnosed with cancer, and the improving survival rates with earlier detection and improved treatments means we've got a whole lot of what we now call cancer survivors. Now these data are not uh, really up to date. It says about 700,000, but based on up-to-date data, as well as um, data for uh, people who've been diagnosed more than 10 years ago, there's over a million Canadians who are cancer survivors. And in the U.S. it's over 10 million now, it's about 12 million. So um, this number will continue to accumulate. We're going to have very large numbers of cancer survivors. I could go through all the technical issues related to radiation therapy, chemotherapy, how it affects quality of life, how it affects function, and all these sorts of things to make the rationale for looking at exercise but the Canadian Cancer Society, I think, does a reasonable job in its statistics brochure, just summarizing it. It says a large number of Canadians live with the effects of cancer, require repeated active treatments, and have a continuing need for cancer care resources and support services. So they go through these difficult treatments, and many will go through multiple treatments over time because many cancers are viewed as a chronic disease that you have to manage over the long time. These can be very difficult treatments uh, that patients need to go through. So let me um, bring you up to date with um, some of the, the major findings in this field and, and where we're at. And then I'll share with you a couple of studies that my group's done in Edmonton. So some of the major research distinctions when you start to go through this literature is one, uh, slicing up the literature by the particular patient or survivor group uh, that you're looking at. Uh, the vast majority of the research has been in breast cancer. So that's the cancer where we know the most about uh, patients on treatment, off treatment, uh, probably 60 to 70 percent of the studies have been done in that group. Everything else is really uh, very limited research. Prostate cancer, we have some studies, colon cancer and so on, but then we get into a large number of cancers, and remember I mentioned there's over 200 different types, where we have not a single study looking at the role of exercise for functioning, quality of life, or disease outcomes. So it is really still an unchartered field 
despite the fact that it's exploded over the last 15 years in terms of the, the amount of research. The second uh, important issue in slicing up this field is where on the cancer control continuum are you doing the exercise intervention? We can think of interventions pre-treatment. So these are interventions to try and help people cope with the disease, perhaps delay the need for treatment or help them cope with the treatments that they know are coming down the road. And there are some cancers like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, prostate cancer, where people might be diagnosed and they may not be treated for many months or even years. So that's a, a phase we could look at. There's been very little research in the pre-treatment phase. Treatment phase is uh, what we mean by that is people are being treated with radiation therapy and chemotherapy. That's where a big bulk of the research has been done and I'll share some of our research looking at actual exercise interventions while you're on chemotherapy. So it's a very um, novel time to be looking at the role of exercise and what it might be able to do. Survivorship phase is viewed as after these primary treatments when people are considered disease free and uh, otherwise good health. And so the whole survivorship area is really growing in importance. And uh, there's been lots of exercise studies in the survivorship period. So people complete treatments and you're looking at recovery after treatments. And also some interesting data I'll share with you on exercise relationship with the risk of recurrence of the disease and death from cancer. Some very interesting data there. Uh, the last phase we can call end of life or palliative phase. So this is for uh, people with advanced cancer where it's progressive and incurable. And the question becomes, is there any role for exercise during this very difficult phase? As you can imagine, there's not a lot of research in this area, but there is some starting to, to determine whether or not exercise can help people maintain independence or uh, maintain quality of life for as long as possible. Um, the last area when you dig into this research is what's the primary outcome? What's the focus? of the uh, particular study. And we can break that down into several different areas. HRF meaning health related fitness. So the things like uh, um, cardiorespiratory fitness, muscular strength, muscular endurance, flexibility, uh, body composition outcomes and so on. The pros are what we call patient reported outcomes. In the clinical uh, medicine areas like cancer these are very important outcomes. So this would include quality of life, fatigue, uh, uh, peripheral neuropathy, other sorts of symptoms and side effects that patients would report, as well as things like depression or anxiety. So any sort of issues that patients would report. Um, and these are very important outcomes that many of these supportive care interventions are targeted towards addressing. Treatment outcomes, uh, and I'll share some interesting data with you there on the role of exercise in perhaps influencing uh, people's ability to go through these treatments biomarkers and then ultimately disease outcomes. For many in this field that's kind of the holy grail in terms of outcomes. Can exercise really reduce the risk of the disease coming back or can it prolong survival? Many cancer patients are interested in that question and many of the oncologists want to know what's the role of these types of lifestyle factors in, in, uh, um, in what they call disease control or survival. And then lastly, we can look at exercise as an outcome. So once we show that exercise is beneficial, we can do interventions to try and promote physical activity and increase exercise. And of course, that's going to be a very important area. We know that the majority of the general population have difficulty uh, adhering to exercise. You can imagine trying to exercise while you're going through chemotherapy, radiation therapy, or some of these other treatments. So that whole area is going to be phenomenally important as well. So let me uh, give you a couple of the trials that we've done at uh, University of Alberta. This was one of our uh, recent ones here where we focused on breast cancer patients on chemotherapy. <coughs> uh, we compared an aerobic exercise group to a resistance exercise group versus usual care. And usual care right now for most patients is they get no recommendation to exercise. They're sort of uh, do whatever they want. And in fact, sometimes they'll even get recommendations to take it easy or rest while they go through these difficult treatments. So that's still kind of usual care for patients on chemotherapy. Multicenter trial with Edmonton, um, Roan Siegel, a medical oncologist in Ottawa, and Don McKenzie, an exercise physiologist in Vancouver, funded by the Canadian Breast Cancer Research Alliance. So in the aerobic exercise group, we had them come in, do supervised exercise three times per week on a bike, treadmill or elliptical. 
Uh, started them off at a moderate intensity, uh, moderate duration, and then attempted to progress them over the course of these chemotherapies. This can be a challenge because in a sort of regular population, we can systematically progress an exercise prescription. When you get uh, patients on chemotherapy who are typically getting four to six cycles of chemotherapy, sometimes the toxicities accumulate over the course of chemotherapy. And so the symptoms and side effects are accumulating at the same time you're trying to increase the exercise prescription. So it's, it's quite a balance between how they're responding to the treatments and how you're trying to progress the exercise prescription. But nevertheless, we attempted to do it. Resistance training, <clears throat> 8 to 12 repetitions, 9 different uh, uh, exercises, and about 60 to 70 percent of their one repetition maximum. The usual care group didn't engage in any structured exercise. The first interesting and I think important finding is we had an adherence rate of about 70 percent. So that was the average adherence. The median was somewhere around 80 percent. So certainly uh, the majority of breast cancer patients were able to exercise during their chemotherapy. However, uh, the reverse of that is there is some who found it extremely difficult and were not able to complete the exercise program. So we're not going to get the type of adherence rates we might get in other populations. I won't present the data here, but we asked them for every single exercise session they missed, why they missed it. How come they didn't come to do the supervised exercise? And as you might expect, the majority of reasons were, were related to side effects of the disease or the treatment. So nausea, vomiting, hospitalization, diarrhea, um, peripheral neuropathy, all these types of things, infections, all the side effects that happen. So it wasn't lack of motivation. These were very motivated women going through these treatments, but uh, the difficulties of, of those side effects. And when we present these data, these are what we call intention to treat analysis. So that includes everyone in the analysis, whether they showed up to the exercise once or whether they had perfect adherence. And one of the um, important findings is we did get a significant effect on their aerobic fitness, but you can see what happened. Largely what we're doing is preventing decline that occurs in the usual care group. So this is kind of the first evidence to show decline in an objective maximal VO2 peak uh, exercise test over the course of chemotherapy. And our aerobic exercise program allowed them to maintain that. So there's various possible explanations including um, severe anemia, big drops in hemoglobin. So you're training people in the face of big declines in hemoglobin. So, so the loss uh, to, to VO2 peak that's maybe occurring because of the decline in hemoglobin is being compensated for by improvements in other mechanisms. We didn't actually go in and, and look at those mechanisms, although we're, we're trying to do that now. Uh, improvements in muscular strength, as you would uh, expect from the resistance exercise group. Uh, about a 30% improvement in overall muscular strength. Some of the interesting things you can do in these types of trials is look at these subgroup effects to see is one subgroup uh, responding better than another subgroup. And one of the things we looked at is whether they were on chemotherapies that involved taxanes or chemotherapies that didn't have taxanes. And what you can see from these data here is we got a better response to the resistance training program in terms of strength improvements for the women who are on the non-taxane chemotherapies than those who are on the taxanes. And these taxanes can be problematic um, related to muscle function and muscle physiology. So there is some literature showing some of the damage that these taxanes can do to muscle function. There wasn't differences in adherence. Okay? The, the taxane group had the same level of, of adherence as the non-taxane group, but they didn't have as uh, a good a response to the um, resistance training intervention. So very interesting finding how it's modified even by the type of chemotherapy protocol that uh, these women were on. Improvements in lean body mass that would, you would also expect. These women put on more than a kilogram of muscle while they were going through chemotherapy by engaging in this resistance training program. Interesting thing is big differences in their body composition response based on their disease stage. Women who had early stage breast cancer, stage 1 and stage 2A, which is primarily what we call node negative, so it's, it's restricted to the, the local breast area, you can see they didn't get much of a response from lean body mass. In fact, no response. The women with uh, stage 2B and 3A disease, so this is primarily node positive, so the disease has spread into the nodes and a little bit further, they got a huge response from the resistance training program. Uh, you can see compared to usual care, 
um, almost three kilograms of muscle they put on by going through this resistance training program. And the length of the program is about 12 to 24 weeks. So the chemotherapy protocols vary a little bit depending on the number of cycles. The median was about 17 weeks of training. Changes in body fat. Um, this is also very important. What you see in the usual care group is this is with a DEXA scan as well. Um, uh, they put on a percent, absolute 1% body fat, which was largely prevented in the two exercise groups. This is important because we know body weight is a strong predictor of recurrence of breast cancer. So women who are overweight and obese at the time of diagnosis have a greater likelihood of the disease coming back, independent of any other factors. So some of the thinking is potentially weight loss programs may have implications for the risk of the disease coming back. So this is a, an important finding. And again, similar to our lean body mass finding, completely moderated by the stage of disease. The early stage women really no body composition effect for percent body fat. Um, the more advanced disease stage, huge impact. All right, so whether you're early stage or later stage, the usual care group has the same increase in fat, but the effects of our intervention were um, pronounced only for the advanced stage group. We improved self-esteem, <coughs> a very important variable for uh, breast cancer patients who are going on chemotherapy. Declines in self-esteem, how they felt about themselves in the usual care group, these were largely reversed by uh, the exercise training program. So some psychosocial benefits in addition to some of the functional benefits. Uh, but no doubt the most uh, provocative finding, I think, from these data is we actually had an effect on relative dose intensity of the chemotherapy received. So this is uh, what we call chemotherapy completion rate. And we can calculate all the drugs that they receive, and we can calculate any dose reductions. We can calculate when they receive the drugs, which typically is supposed to be every three weeks, and whether or not those are delays. Right, so if there's any reductions in the drugs that are given or any delays in treatments, this can affect the risk of recurrence. So you want to get all your drugs that you're supposed to get and you want to get them on the proper schedule. And the way they calculate that is based on this relative dose intensity. And we really monitored this more from a safety perspective. In other words, we were hoping we didn't interfere with their ability to complete treatment while getting these quality of life and functional benefits. What we actually found is a positive effect as you can see. So the usual care group completed about 84%. 80, I was about 90% in the resistance group. So they completed more of their chemotherapy and more of it on time going through the exercise program. The aerobic exercise group completed more, but it wasn't statistically significant. Very important finding. And the, the cut point that um, many medical oncologists use is you want the cancer patient, in this case the breast cancer patient, to receive at least 85% of the planned dose. And the literature shows if you get at least 85%, uh, you get a very good outcome. If you fall below that, increased risk of uh, local recurrence, distal recurrence, and death from cancer. So they do everything in their power to get at least 85%. And you can see a borderline significant effect here. In the usual care group, only about 66% of the women received 85% or more of their planned relative dose intensity. In the resistance training group, about 78%. So about a 12 or 13% absolute difference in the number of women who are getting what we know to be an effective dosage of chemotherapy. So this uh, has stimulated a lot of interest and in, in excitement in the literature. So let me shift now to one of the many understudied cancer patient groups. I mentioned breast is the most studied. Uh, some of the more common ones, I mentioned the big four, lung, uh, colorectal, and um, prostate. This is actually number five. So it doesn't get a lot of attention because it falls below the big four, but lymphoma is actually the fifth most common cancer diagnosed in Canada and the U.S. So these are cancers of the lymph system. They include Hodgkin lymphoma and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So we wanted to do a trial in, in this group. We called it the HELP trial. And we compared uh, aerobic exercise training group uh, to usual care in 122 lymphoma patients. About half of them or so were receiving chemotherapy and half were off treatments. And I use the term off treatment rather than post treatment because these patients oftentimes cycle on and off treatments over an extended course of many years. 
excuse me, but that allowed us then to compare the effects of training on chemotherapy versus training off chemotherapy and what kind of response do we get depending on that important factor. We did a 12-week supervised training program. Our primary endpoint is physical functioning. We, it's, this is called the Trial Outcome Index Anemia Scale. So for those of you not in the area, that uh, won't mean a whole lot. But it's patient-rated physical functioning. How well am I functioning physically? So we can separate the physical and functional aspects of quality of life from the emotional, social aspects of quality of life. We also looked at health-related fitness, other patient-reported outcomes, and even some of the medical data. And I think appropriately this was funded by the Lance Armstrong Foundation, which is very interested in cancer survivorship and has money available for these sorts of trials. Um, so we uh, had a very good adherence in this trial, about 78%, median adherence somewhere around 90%. And uh, we got very nice effects on patient reports of physical functioning. So the overall effect you can see here is about nine points. And we're able to determine that this is a meaningful change in how these patients were functioning because on this scale they estimate about a six point change as being meaningful, meaning that the patients would notice that they're, they're able to function better. Overall effect was about nine points. You can see in the comparison between the chemotherapy and off treatments that the overall magnitude of the effect is virtually identical. So they benefited about 9 or 10 points, whether they're on chemotherapy or whether they're off treatment. But the interesting finding, and the one you would predict from knowledge of this literature, is when you're intervening with patients on chemotherapy, you're actually preventing decline from the usual care group, and then you're showing some genuine improvements. Where when you're in the off treatment setting, you're largely getting all gains in functioning compared to smaller gains in the um, off treatment group. So that was our primary endpoint, a very important finding to show that lymphoma patients can do the exercise and get these very important uh, benefits to quality of life. Interesting, I talked about moderators, so things that might influence how these groups respond. So we looked at patient reports of their health at baseline and on this five point scale they can say they're in poor health, fair health, good, very good or excellent. And so you can see we got a very powerful moderator in these analyses. Virtually all the benefit was wrapped up in those patients who weren't functioning very well at baseline. And you can see that this is uh, 18, 20, about a 30 point difference on a scale where they say six points is meaningful. Some smaller benefits here in the very good excellent group and in the good group. Not big numbers, it wasn't a huge trial, 122 patients, but still very suggestive of I think what most people in exercise science already know and that is the people who are functioning the worst tend to benefit the most from these types of exercise interventions. So this is what our data were showing in lymphoma patients. Fitness changes mirrored our um, quality of life changes that I showed you. So you can see overall uh, improvement of almost uh, 5 mils, about a 20% improvement in exercise capacity uh, in this group. Virtually identical between the chemo, whoops, uh, between the chemotherapy and off treatment group, but once again preventing decline in fitness that occurs with chemotherapy versus pure gains in fitness for those who are off treatment. This may be important in lymphoma patients because we know in virtually every other patient population, exercise capacity is an independent predictor of mortality, right? For any of you who looked at those data. We don't have the same data in cancer patients. We don't know if um, aerobic fitness at the time of diagnosis or after treatment is a predictor of mortality, but we don't have any reason to believe that the association would be different. And if that association holds up, uh, these type of data suggest there may be implications for survival after lymphoma uh, with these large improvements in fitness. Uh, we did get change in lean body mass and identical to our breast cancer trial they were moderated by the stage of disease. So once again we get an identical finding um, where it's the patients with more advanced disease stage that get big improvements in lean body mass and this was only a cycle ergometer so it's not a resistance training program we're expecting big benefits in lean body mass. But with the more advanced disease stage uh, they were showing uh, muscle response even to that type of aerobic exercise intervention. 
We did follow the chemotherapy data in the HELP trial. We didn't track it drug for drug detailed like we did in the START trial, but we looked at the percentage of cycles that they completed. And oftentimes in lymphoma, um, oncologists are giving a range of cycles that are recommended. So it might be six to eight cycles. So we can look at what percentage of their minimum and what percentage of their maximum cycles did they complete. These data suggest no difference. So we didn't interfere with their ability to complete chemotherapy. They received the same number of cycles on this uh, aerobic exercise program as the usual care group did. The more provocative finding from this study is we also tracked their treatment response. So at the end of treatment, the oncologists will uh, evaluate what kind of response did they have to the treatment. And as you can see here, there's some suggestion, this is not statistically significant, and it wasn't, uh, the trial wasn't powered to look at that, but you can see they can rate the disease as either stable, so the disease really hasn't changed too much. They can rate it as a partial response, meaning the disease has shrunk or the number of sites have been reduced, or they can rate it as a complete response, meaning there's no evidence of disease at the end of the treatment. Uh, here from the data you can see those who participated in our exercise program about 46% had a complete response compared to only about 30% in the usual care group. Uh, not a statistically significant finding and the trial wasn't powered for it, but a suggestive of a possible better response to treatment if you're doing exercise training um, during it. At a minimum, it suggests that patients can do these very vigorous uh, high intensity exercise interventions without jeopardizing their ability to complete chemotherapy or their response to treatment. The other thing we looked at is why did they get these improvements in these patient reports of functioning? And here uh, we wanted to test the improvements in fitness. Is that really what's driving their improvements in functioning? And for those of you who know a little bit about the mediation literature, this is a very simple way we test it. We can look at the effects of the intervention, which is their group assignment, on their changes. In this case, it's their reports of physical functioning. As I mentioned, this was the effect, 0.012 significant and this is just the effect as a regression coefficient. We can then plug in any variable we want to test as a mediator. And in this case, it's their change in their VO2 peak, so their improvement in fitness. And what you need to see is that the effect of the intervention on fitness is huge, as we showed, and that this change in fitness is associated with this change in patient reports of physical functioning, and now the effect of the intervention is no longer significant. All right, so you can see this was the effect of the intervention. We test our mediator, completely wipes it out. So these data suggest that the reason our intervention improved uh, their ability to function, their, their reports of it, is because of these improvements in fitness. So good evidence that it's likely something to do with the exercise intervention that's improving functioning. One of the most uh, important outcomes for cancer patients is fatigue. Many of the treatments cancer patients receive really drive fatigue. In early days, the recommendation was to take it easy. That's the best way to cope with the fatigue. Take it easy, get other people to do things for you, and rest. And what we now know is that these exercise training programs actually reduce fatigue. They don't increase the fatigue. And in fact, we had a nice effect on fatigue in our trial that I didn't mention. Um, <clears throat> but a big effect, lower fatigue for the group that did the exercise, and once again, fitness is virtually a complete mediator. So improvements in their ability uh, to do the um, exercise work is influencing their uh, reports of fatigue. So a very uh, important finding for the cancer literature. Now unless you think, well, maybe fitness mediates everything, all these variables that we're looking at, we also measured things like depression and happiness, one of my favorite outcomes to measure in any trial. Are they happier at the end of the trial? The effects of the intervention, very large on happiness. Of course, the same effect on VO2 peak. VO2 peak's not really related to happiness change, and you get absolutely no mediation. So these data suggest that the effect our intervention had on their happiness has really nothing to do with their improvements in fitness. So other aspects of the intervention, whether they're the psychosocial aspects, uh, it's a supervised program, there's other cancer patients exercising, whether these other factors might account for the improvements in happiness we're not sure, but it doesn't appear that fitness changes drive these changes in happiness. So I'll quickly go to the exercise and disease outcomes uh, because this is where uh, we're headed in some of our research and where there's a lot of excitement in the literature. There has been some studies done 
They're all observational, so we don't have any randomized trial data looking at disease outcomes, but we've got observational studies which are very good preliminary evidence. They are all based on self-report data, so keep that in mind, but the preliminary findings are positive. How important are these findings? Well, the first study that tested in length was published in JAMA. So that's how important they view this particular finding, as that is the uh, one of two most prestigious medical journals to get your research published in. So this is a study from the Nurses Health Study. Almost 3,000 nurses, they were all diagnosed with this stage one to three breast cancer and followed over time. Essentially the design is you assess their physical activity, um, during treatment, soon after treatment, every couple years, and then you follow them over time to see what happens. And they do uh, calculate um, the, the total amount of physical activity that they're participating in. They converted it to METS, and they did co-vary for other disease and treatment variables. We know there's lots of prognostic factors that predict recurrence and death. So the stage of disease, the type of treatments, um, other sorts of um, tumor-related factors, and so on and they followed them up for 96 months and over that time period out of those 3,000 women 463 died 280 of those were considered breast cancer related deaths and 370 had breast cancer recurrences and the key finding that's been re replicated in a few studies now including colon cancer is here's the lowest group so this is the group we call sedentary their risk of, of breast cancer deaths and total deaths is set to one and then we look at what's the effects of increasing amounts of physical activity on their relative risk of death from breast cancer and total deaths. And as you can see, it declines. In fact, it plateaus out here at up to a 40 to 50 percent reduced risk. So that means the women that were exercising the most after their breast cancer treatments had a 40 to 50 percent lower risk of the disease of dying from breast cancer and of dying from all causes. So uh, these data are very exciting and they've been replicated in colon cancer and some of the other uh, cancer groups as well. And it's prompted us to do a study, um, and I'll show you that in a moment. So it's been replicated in colorectal cancer. There's the same pattern, you can take a look at it, I won't go into it in detail, but as you increase physical activity, uh, those are the people that have the lower risk of the disease coming back. They even looked at it in terms of change. All right, so here's death from colorectal cancer. No change, we fixed that to one. If you increased your physical activity after your colorectal cancer diagnosis, you got about a 50% risk of dying from the disease. For those who decreased it, they're actually showing a, a small increase in risk, not statistically significant. And same for overall mortality. And I'll skip over that, but it makes the same sort of point. Those data have prompted us to, to launch what we believe to be the first ever randomized controlled exercise trial looking at disease-free survival as the primary endpoint. Um, so this is a randomized control trial. We're going to compare a three-year physical activity intervention to general health education materials on disease-free survival uh, in colon cancer survivors about two to six months after they complete adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, as I mentioned, it's the first exercise trial with disease outcome as a primary endpoint. It's going to include both Australia and Canada. In Canada right now, we have nine centers that are accruing to the trial. And I'm very pleased to say London is one of those centers with Harry Prapavasis and Michael Sanitani from the London Regional Cancer Center are going to be putting patients on this trial, along with many other cancer centers across Canada. In Australia, the study's being run out of Sydney right now, and it's going to be expanded uh, to other cancer centers in, in Sydney as well. And um, it's been funded by the uh, NCIC Clinical Trials Group. And about a thousand patients in total will be randomized in this trial and this will provide the definitive evidence for us can we really tell colon cancer patients that if they start exercising after they complete chemotherapy they will be able to reduce their risk of the disease coming back of course we're looking at fatigue quality of life physical functioning many other important endpoints as well but the primary focus is on disease free survival so that's just been launched in the last few months and uh, we're excited to conduct this trial over the next several years. I'll end off with a few future research directions. Uh, very quickly, you can probably get these from uh, earlier parts of my talk. We need to look at disease endpoints, which the patients themselves are very interested in, and other novel endpoints that we haven't looked at. Things like cognitive function, pain, peripheral neuropathy. There's all sorts of side effects and symptoms that we haven't really targeted yet. 
You need larger sample sizes for many of these uh, trials, so multicenter trials are going to likely be uh, the norm. Research in <coughs> any group other than breast cancer. That's not to say breast cancer has been overstudied. It means these other cancers have been understudied. Still have lots of important questions we could look at in breast cancer patients, but we really have very limited data in many other cancer patient groups. Uh, survivors with advanced cancer. Even though we think of that as a very difficult time, some people will live for many months and some even many years with advanced cancer. What's the role of exercise in that group? Is there any benefits um, that, that we can offer them? And then, of course, the more uh, subtle second generation questions where we really try to start op optimizing what type of exercise is best, how much is tolerable during chemotherapy, is it a dose response relationship, or do you get to a point where you say that's too much exercise and it's really starting to cause problems? Mechanisms of changes in outcomes, I think that's always important in our study with disease outcomes. We will be looking at biologic markers, looking at different mechanisms, and you can look at that for quality of life as well. All the subgroup effects, I think, are very important. In any intervention, you're going to have what we call responders and non-responders, and exercise will be no different. So can we identify cancer patients who stand to benefit the most from it, and therefore uh, the time and effort to exercise during treatments is worth it for them, where others who we know based on their profile may not benefit very much, and really to struggle with exercise during treatments may not be time well spent. Compare and integrate exercise with other interventions. Motivation and behavior change will be important. What's the role of the Canadian Cancer Society? What's the role of cancer support groups in trying to encourage patients and survivors and develop programs uh, that, that can get these types of um, programs out to cancer patients? And research on knowledge translation. We're all keen to try and get our research into practice. What's the best way to get these programs to cancer patients? There are programs being set up at YMCA's that are being specifically set up for cancer patients. Other groups are doing that as well. Some cancer centers around the world are having their own fitness centers right in the cancer center for patients to have opportunities to exercise. I'll end by acknowledging many colleagues, students, staff, and study participants, of course, who have contributed to this research over the last 15 years. Uh, and also uh, thank the Canada Research Chairs program that allows me to focus the vast majority of my time on doing this research. And also by uh, what are really the two key people who influenced me here at the University of Western Ontario, my master's thesis supervisor, Chela Chaladurai, Chela and of course, Bert Karen, who is on my committee, but also helped me with many other projects. So special thanks to Bert and Chela for uh, launching me here from Western. Thank you for your time.